We're going to continue in our series this morning on the, the values or the DNA of Emmanuel. And for the last two weeks, I have gone through the one that celebrate Jesus through adamant worship. I started off in Romans chapter 12, looking at individual worship. What does that look like? Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 10 and corporate worship. Why did we go to church in the first place? And so we're moving along, and so it looks like we have three more. So you're stuck with me for another two weeks after this. But uh, I am glad to be able to be up here and uh, bring you the Word of God. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 16 this morning. I, like many of you, have a, have a Facebook account. You know, I've had one for, for a number of years now since they opened it up to the general po- population rather than just being a student in, in college. And, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed has been connecting with old friends, ones from high school or ones from, from college. And every time I either re- requ- request someone to be a friend or someone requests me, I'm, I'm really quite intrigued, especially ones that I haven't seen since I graduated from high school 14 years ago. Or ones that were older than me, that graduated before me, that I haven't seen them or heard from them in, in 15, 16, sometimes 17 years. And I graduated with a little over 300 or so, and I knew almost every one of them fairly well. And when I look at their profiles and I see a glimpse of their lives, I typically have three things that, that go on in my mind. I'm either really enthused, I'm really confused. Or sometimes I'm actually grieved. Some of the people, I I look at their lives and I say, wow, they're they're really doing well. They're in a career. They've got a family. Their things just look like like they're just going really well. There have been a few times that I've been encouraged, especially lately, because I've seen how God has gotten a hold of their heart, and I see that they're just on fire for Jesus. Wow, that's really cool because knowing me and knowing them, some of us are the last people that we would ever expect to be doing what we do. Then there are a few that I look at in confusion. Because when I look at them and I see what's going on in their lives and they expose their lives fairly openly on Facebook, it it seems like they are the exact same person that they were in high school. I'm not talking about their personalities because personalities can, change, can stay the same. But what I'm talking about are those, those people who really haven't grown up quite yet. They're the exact same person. They're doing the same things. They are making the fool, same foolish risks, hanging out with the good old boys and refusing to grow up. And there are some that I just absolutely grieve. There are ones that I haven't seen at all, and I see what's going on in their lives, and they haven't grown, they haven't stayed stagnant, they've rather declined. These are friends who I remember that came from good homes. They had good families, good relationships in high school. They made some mistakes and never really recovered. That's not what I like to see when I become a friend with someone on Facebook. But when I think about reconnecting with old friends on Facebook and I see these these patterns and either feeling encouraged or or confused or, or grieved, I have to wonder if God looks on our lives and feels the same way. When He looks at where we are now compared to where we have been, does He look at our lives in the same way, because what I see with friends on Facebook is, is oftentimes what I have seen in many lives of people who are of the faith. When people come to Christ, they either grow, they either plateau, or they degenerate. However, when we look at what God has to say about what our lives should look like when we become Christians, there's only one option. And that's moving forward into growth, into knowing Christ more, into becoming more and more like Him. Theologically, this is called sanctification. In our church, we call that cultivation of the faith in a personal way. And in our passage this morning, uh, the Apostle Paul is addressing Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor who Paul mentored and and considers him 
his son in the faith. And he is telling Timothy how to cultivate his faith and why it is crucial for him to do so. So the guiding principle in our passage this morning is the first verse in in verse 6, and it's explained in those verses that follow. So let's read the passage then and see what God would have to say to us through the pen of Paul. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. This is what the Holy Spirit writes under the hand of Timothy. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Well, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be people who are continually cultivating our faith. To cultivate our faith, we must be trained in godliness, which is rooted in proper doctrine and displayed in life. And that doctrine and the practice of it must be in harmony together. So let's break that down. that thesis statement, if you will, apart a little bit. Paul first tells us that we need to train ourselves for the purpose of personal godliness. We need to train ourselves for the purpose of personal godliness. The pursuit of godliness or holiness seems to be something that has completely lost and fallen by the wayside in the past 30 or 40 years. It's interesting to me when you look at the history of the church and how the, the pursuit of holiness has changed. Up to about the, the Reformation in about the 1500s, the pursuit of personal holiness was sort of looked at as reserved for only those select few, those holy ones who would, who would feel the call of God and either enter a, a convent or a monastery and give themselves holy to, to um, being in seclusion and studying the Word of God and not having anything to do with the outside world. Well, when the Reformation came around the 1500s or so, and the Bible was translated into common tongues, it is no surprise then that people all of a sudden would start pursuing personal holiness. So when they get God's Word, there was a drive to know who He is, drive to, to be like Him. And it was culminated, this movement was culminated in the Puritans in the 1700s, who every fiber of their being was personal holiness and to be like Jesus Christ. And it seems like ever since about that time, we have been on a slow decline on personal holiness to the point where many of us don't even think much about it at all. In the church, we have become completely distracted. We have become distracted in such a way that we structure our churches in in the way that we are more concerned with filling the pews than filling pews people with the knowledge and teaching practical uh, theology on how to live out the Christian life. In our personal lives, we are so distracted by entertainment. We are so distracted by email and text message and our, our children's extracurricular activities and things of that sort that we feel that any attempt at personal holiness is only something that we will do if we have time for. Because we have other things that are more important, more priorities that are, that are important besides our, our personal holiness. But Paul tells us that cultivating the faith is growing in godliness and it is crucial 
for our lives. He is preempting here what he would later say in chapter 6, verse 6, where he says, There is great gain in holiness. And he is echoing what the author of Hebrews says when he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. So there is a great urgency for us to cultivate our faith by growing in godliness. So how do we do this? How do, how do we grow to be more like Jesus? I would suggest that Paul is writing to Timothy and would write to us the exact same thing today. And he would tell us to work hard at what we would call the spiritual disciplines. It's taking time uh, to practice the regular intake and meditation and memorization of God's Word, that we would practice deep, effective prayer, that we would engage God in meaningful worship, that we would communicate God through personal evangelism, that we would honor God through service, that we would display God through our service, that we would long for Him through our fasting, that we would wait on Him in silence and solitude, and that we would respond to Him in obedience. That's an awfully long list that I just rattled off there. When you look at all those personal spiritual disciplines, and we've all heard about them all, it's easy to get discouraged and and maybe think, well, it's just legalistic if if I have to do all these things. But Paul is not saying here, get to it or else. He is encouraging Timothy. He says, train yourself for godliness. Now, I am not an athlete, but I do know that if I want to run a marathon, I am not just going to be able to get off the couch and run the 26.2 miles that are necessary. It would take weeks, months, or in my case, possibly even years to train, to run 26.2 miles. And perhaps our modern allergy to the pursuit of holiness doesn't have so much to do with our distraction as it does with our motivation. Maybe it's our motivation that's the problem. The reason that we're distracted by so many other things is because we have motivation to pursue them over what God calls us to be motivated for. There is personal motivation to get back to that text message. There is personal motivation to write that email out. There is personal motivation to the business of our children's activities. Whatever it is that we put before personal godliness, we put those before that because we see them as a greater thing to do now. It's an issue of motivation. Oftentimes when we look at growing in personal holiness... We look at it in the same way that I used to look at choir rehearsals. Many of you know that I have a background in choir. I uh, was a public school choir teacher for a few years, and and there was a time in, in high school or college, whenever it was, that I just did not like going to rehearsal. It was boring. They brought hard work endless techniques. They were tedious. And in college, you met every day for an hour and you only got one credit for it. There were many days that would come into rehearsal, either as a student or or even as the conductor, that I wished that I could be somewhere else. But whenever concert season would come out, I would step onto the stage with my ensemble And we as a group would pour everything that we had into that music. And I tell you, there were some times in some of those concerts that there were some thrilling moments. There were moments when we would sing our final note and we would hear the echo go through the auditorium and we all just wished that time could stop just for a little bit. Because there's just something amazing that was happening in that moment. It was in those moments that I remembered this is why we rehearsed. 
This is why we did the hard work. This is why we sat in in those chairs for endless hours every day. Getting those techniques. Working out those issues. Because of what happened in the concert. This is why I'm okay with only getting one credit out of this. It was after those performances that I joyfully then walked into rehearsal because I knew what the end product was going to be like. And for many of us in our Christian lives, we don't want to make the habit of training for godliness because we dread the rehearsal room. We dread the rehearsal room. Paul says in verse 8, Godliness is of every value, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. You see, we forget that in the rehearsal room, we're not just working uh, toward the peace, but we're becoming better all around musicians, all the while looking forward to that final product. And in the spiritual life of the Christian, working towards godliness not only benefits us in the here and now as, as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it prepares us for The stage of eternity. Again, because without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. It is in the practice of those spiritual disciplines that we can truly live today. And uh, the practices that we walk in today, we will one day see Jesus and say, Because you walked in this way, well done, good and faithful servant. It's by working it out today that we can see the glory in a more glorious way then. In verse 10, Paul says that that godliness ought to be the chief goal for every Christian because we know who God is. We know his holiness. We know his greatness. We know his perfection. We know his great love for us. We know what he has done for us. This ought to be the goal because we have our eyes set on him. Paul says it is for this goal, this end, this holiness, this pursuit of holiness that we work and we strive. We work hard to be like him in the rehearsal room of life so that one day we can be like him in the sta- on the stage of eternity. So with that, I have to ask you, what is it that's distracting you today? What is it that is a higher priority than personal holiness? What is it that you have set before becoming more like Jesus Christ? Are you desiring to be on the stage of faith but refusing or possibly even neglecting The rehearsal. Training isn't easy. Any performer or any athlete will tell you that the end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. The long hours in the gym, the the muscular pain that comes with it, the restrictive diet that you have to go on was worth the sacrifice when you can lean over and that person puts the gold medal around your neck. It was worth it. And Paul says that bodily training is only of some value. It's only of some value because every single one of us, whether we're young or old, our bodies are going to wear out and one day we're not going to be here anymore. It's only a value of some good. But godliness is good in every way. We train ourselves for godliness because the outer self will wear away, but the inner self grows stronger until the day that we see Christ Jesus in glory. So we need to train ourselves for the purpose of godliness. But we also need to, secondly, cultivate our beliefs and action so that they're in harmony together. We need to cultivate our beliefs and our actions so that they are in harmony together. Together. I'm old enough now where sociologists have a name for my generation. I have now been lumped into what they call the millennial generation. It's comprised of people who were born between the years of 1981 and 1996, and one of the chief values of this generation that they have found is that this is a generation that values. 
people who are authentic. They value authenticity almost above all else. People in my age group have an intolerance of what we would call hypocrisy. There is among people my age who would then see people who are in the church as hypocrites, which is one reason why the millennial generation is missing in churches. But you know, when I think of hypocrites and people who are fake, Christians are not typically the first group that I think of. You know who are? Sumo wrestlers. (laughs) Sumo wrestling is perhaps one of the most celebrated sports in Japan. If you're a Japanese sumo wrestler, you have a great incentive to do well. Because how you rank and how you do determines really how great your life is is, how much money you make, how large a posse that you can have along with you, um, how much you get to eat, how much you get to sleep, how much you get to celebrate your success is determined upon how good you are ranked in the sumo world. The, they're the 66 highest rank wrestlers in Japan, they, they comprise of two classes, one called the Makauchi and the Euro Division. And the wrestler that may be at the top of that list can make millions throughout the year. They're the most celebrated athletes. If you are in the top 40, you make 140000 minimum. But if you're below that top 40, you may make $15,000 a year. So there is great incentive to be a good sumo wrestler. In Japan, sumo wrestling is highly regarded It's fiercely competitive, and it is viewed as having the most high level of integrity of any sport in Japan. If the press were to even hint that there was cheating involved in sumo wrestling, it would create a national furor. People in Japan will get defensive if the integrity of sumo wrestling is even questioned. But when economists Stephen Levitt and Stephen Debner uh, analyzed the results of 32,000 matches featuring 281 wrestlers from January 1989 through January of 2000, the results pointed toward sumo wrestling as being something that is anything but honest in its results. What they found was that a wrestler's rank is based upon their performance in these what they call elite tournaments. If he finishes the tournament with a winning record, that is, if he has eight wins or more, he is considered elite and his ranking will rise. If he has a losing record, his ranking will fall. So therefore, the eighth victory is crucial for sumo wrestlers. It will determine what their life is going to be like. So when the numbers were crunched, they found an interesting bit of information. That when a sumo wrestling match pitted a wrestler who had already won eight matches for the match versus someone who needs one more in order to be in that elite class, the predicted outcome was that the winner with eight victories would win 48% of the time. The actual was they only won 20% of the time in order to get the person that needs one more victory into that elite class. So the economists look at this and say, well, what's going on here? How is this possible? And what they come to is that that quite possibly these wrestlers made a quid pro quo argument, which is something to the extent of, if you let me win today, I will let you win today, and I'll possibly slip you some money under the table when we go out to eat after this. So here is a sport that has the national spotlight. It has the highest regard for integrity in all of Japan, and the sport and its athletes are looked at as superstars who have no flaws to them. And from all appearances, it would seem that that is the case. But when the numbers are crunched, though, the data points to a much 
different reality, one of hypocrisy and one of deceit. So what do Japanese sumo wrestlers have to do with us in the church? We who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are living for a far greater glory than a Japanese sumo wrestler. And yet we are not that much different. We approach the arena of life. We have the right outfits. We have the right words to say. We have the right actions to do. Yet many of us know that if spiritual economists were to look at the record of our lives, that the data would show that we're rigging the match. For some of us, perhaps, many of us, what people are seeing on the outside is not a clear indication of what is happening in the inside. You see, the Apostle Paul says in verse 16 that Timothy is to keep a close watch on himself and on the teaching. There are two areas in the believer's lives that we ought to make sure are harmonious. First one is our lives, our behaviors, our actions. Are they in line with the teaching, the doctrine, what the Word says? The Christian life is a life of faith, but that life of faith is not divorced from knowledge at all. In fact, knowledge is to trump our feelings or emotions in many regards, Because it is only through the the knowledge of the Scriptures that we find the truth of Jesus Christ and what He has for us. Timothy, uh, in in chapter 2, verse 4 of 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. In the letter of Colossians, chapter 1, Paul prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of the truth. Of God's will. And that we are to bear fruit in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. He goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 10, that we are renewed by knowledge. So the Christian life is a life that is based on knowledge of what the Bible says, on knowing who God is and, and, and being intimate with Him through how He communicates Himself. But it's not as if that knowledge is merely to just stay on in the head. Paul is also very clear that what we have in our head ought to permeate from our head into our hearts and ought to be then lived out in our actions or in our lives. It is those two components. It's the knowledge of God and the practice of God by which we are training for godliness. And when one of those two are off, either our actions or our knowledge, when one of those are off, it can wreak havoc in our lives and also the lives of those around us. You see, we can only get away with one of those being off for so long. Sumo wrestlers, they are really good at keeping a secret of what's happening in those matches. You and I are not so good. Truth eventually has its way of coming out. That secret sin that you're desperately trying to conceal will eventually squeak its way out. Or if it doesn't, It'll put you in such inner turmoil that you won't know what to do with yourself. The conflict that's in the home that you don't want anyone to know about. It will get out. Teenagers, that life that you might be living outside of your parents' knowledge will catch up to you. Whatever it is that we are failing to believe in, the doctrines of the faith will eventually manifest its way out somehow. Now, I'm not saying this to condemn anyone. Because if we're honest, every single one of us in this room are hypocrites. I am. You are. None of us have lives that are lined up. But 
the good news is that there is immense grace that is available to every single one of us. The Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and lived the perfect life that you and I aren't. So that when we trust in Him, we can be presented before God in perfection, though we're not perfect. There is immense grace in that He died the death that you deserved in order that you can be forgiven and made new, made into live lives as you were created to live. But that grace is not given in the darkness of shadows. That grace is given in light. It is given in confession and repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we have to keep a close watch on both our doctrine and our lives. Failure to cultivate either one will not result in cultivation. It will result in an uprooting. The greatest need in your life right now is not to update the kitchen. The greatest need in your life right now is not to get to Target at 3 a.m. on Thursday morning in order to get that TV that you have desperately wanted to have. Your greatest need right now is so deep that it is greater than that paycheck that you need that is coming on Friday. Your greatest need right now is your personal holiness. Your greatest need is to strive to be more like Jesus Christ. This need is so great that it not only affects you, but it affects those that are around you as well. Look with me again in verse 16. It says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. And Paul, again, is writing to Timothy, a young pastor in the church of Ephesus, perhaps the biggest church in Asia Minor at this time. And so undoubtedly, here is Timothy, a young man who has an awful lot of influence among a lot of people. And Paul is not saying here that Timothy has the power to save anybody. Paul is very clear that the only way that we are saved is by faith, uh, grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if his doctrine is pure, and his doctrine is shown through his words and his life, he has a major good that he is doing for his congregation. You might not be a pastor, but make no mistake about it, you have influence on people in your life. Your greatest need is your holiness. Your spouse's greatest need is your holiness. Your children's greatest need is your holiness. For some of us, our grandparents' greatest need is your holiness. For some of us, your parents' greatest need is your holiness. So the question is, Do you need to stop rigging the spiritual sumo match? If so, let's begin cultivating that faith so that your belief and your your lives begin lining up together. You know, Facebook might reveal a lot about how people change, whether for the worse or for the better. But the God book of the Bible tells us that there is great mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ and there is hope for change. Now, I don't know what, what's going on in your life right now, whether you're a seasoned spiritual athlete or whether you are a seasoned spiritual couch potato. The Apostle Paul tells us that wherever we are, we still have work to do. 
That wherever we are, while we have lung, breath, uh, air in our lungs, we are to cultivate the faith and become more like Jesus. And we do so by spiritual training and having consistent lives that press on to be more like Jesus. Let's do this. Let's cultivate the faith. And let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your great word to us. Your words are truth. Your words bring life. Lord, I do pray that you would help us to cultivate the faith. There's none of us in this room that is where we need to be. We are all continually on the journey of faith, trying to be more like Jesus. But God, I also thank you that as hard as we try, we can't do anything without you. And so, God, I do pray that your Holy Spirit would come and that he would enable us to be motivated to follow you, to train ourselves in godliness. Father, I pray for those in this room that might be convicted this morning. I do pray that you would give them great grace, that you would help them to begin the journey of cultivating. Perhaps there's someone in this room, Lord, that has been a Christian for 20 years, but still has not actively pursued Jesus. God, I pray that repentance would bear great fruit, that we would all strive to be more like Christ. God, I pray for those who may not have professed Christ all in their life, And that these words may make absolute no sense to them. Lord, we pray that you would quicken dead hearts this morning. And that they would come to realize that there is mercy and there is grace and there is freedom in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for revealing yourself in your word. And ask, uh, and ask that you would conform us to the image of your Son. And it's through his name that we ask all these things. Amen.